Let's talk now about what to do with the dollar, especially for teenagers and for kids. This is really important because this is one of the best places to start when you're like 15 years old, mid-teens. This is a great place. What to do with the dollar. Now, here's the tendency on attitude because attitude determines so much of our lives. What difference does it make if a child has a dollar when you ask what should he do with it? It's only a child and it's only a dollar. But see, here's where it all begins. Your financial journey begins with what you do with the first dollar. It's where it begins. Now, sure, you can do the wrong things and finally correct that, get on a better path, but it all begins on what you do with your resources. Jot this phrase down. It's one of the best for the weekend. Here's the two challenges of life. Number one, the development of our full potential. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is the wise use of all our resources. That sums up life in general. The development of all of our potential and the wise use of all our resources. One of our resources is time, and we talked about that. Now we're going to talk about the wise resource called money. And let me share with you now a little plan. Because when I met Shof, and he asked me about my financial condition, he said, how much money have you saved and invested the last six years? And I said, zero. He said, not a good number. Here's what I told him. If I had more money, I'd have a better plan. Now, jot this down, because here's what he said. If you had a better plan, you would have more money. Next key phrase, it's not the amount that counts, it's the plan that counts. So let's start with something now as seemingly as small as one dollar. What should you do with it? Here's what we teach, teenagers especially. You should never spend more than 70 cents. Never spend more than 70 cents of each dollar you earn or each dollar that comes your way by gift or by labor. Now, you've got to have some plan what to do with your dollar. I've developed this little plan simply for suggestion, and then you've got to do the rest to revise it and do whatever you want to with it. But here's what I teach. Never spend more than 70 cents. You've got to pick something, some number. This is the best one I could figure out. Now we've got another 10 cents and another 10 cents and another 10 cents, which is the 30 plus the 70, which is the full dollar. So we spend nothing more than 70 cents. Now what do we do with the other 30? Here's some of the most important information. 10 cents is for charity or for church, or whatever worthy projects you think you might engage in. Here's one of the best things to teach kids, generosity. Because first we're going to teach abundance, to provide more than you could use for yourself. The be fruitful philosophy that we talked about yesterday means to produce more than you need, so you have more the necessity, you have some to share. Some churches teach a 10%, a tithe, they call it, which is fine. The key is to either administer this 10 cents yourself or to give it to some institution, a church or whatever, and let them spread it around. Let them put it where it's needed. Now, if you're going to give to some charity or church, you... you you must let them take you on the tour and show you where it goes. Okay, if you part with the money, let them give you the tour. Here's where the 10% goes if you're going to tie. Because now that gives you great joy to give 10%. Because you say, hey, here's what it's doing, here's what it's doing, here's where it's going, here's who gets it. Okay. Now the next 10 cents is called the use of capital. I have the unique privilege now to teach capitalism in Russia. When I first went, I told you, 8,000 in my class in Moscow. I teach capital. Let me give you now my definition of capital and capitalism. It's just in a couple of sentences. Because Marx was wrong. Lenin was wrong. They didn't understand capitalism. Here's what they taught. Uh, capitalism is a big company that abuses its workers. I mean, how ridiculous can you be? Anybody can abuse another person. We don't call it capitalism. One child can abuse another child. We don't call it capitalism. One family can abuse another family. We don't call it capitalism. 
people can abuse other people. That's not. So whether it's a big company, it's, it's wrong no matter what it is. But they said, no, no, that's capitalism. A big company that abuses its workers. That's ridiculous. Wish I'd have been back there to debate the subject. Here's what capital and capitalism is. So jot this down. Capital is any value you set aside. Capital is any value you set aside to be invested in an enterprise that brings value to the marketplace, hoping to make a profit. That's what capital and capitalism is. I can say it in one sentence. Capital is any value you set aside to be invested in an enterprise that brings value to the marketplace, hoping to make a profit. Now, the capital is the value you set aside. Taking capital and investing it in an enterprise and bringing the value to the marketplace we call capitalism. Capital and capitalism. It is so simple that to mess it up with some weirdo kind of philosophy is a disgrace. Now, who can understand this? First of all, the farmers understand it. Here's what seed corn is. It's capital. It's seed corn means the seed that you set aside to be planted in the ground, take care of in the summer, hoping to have a profit and a harvest in the fall. So the farmer sets aside his seed corn. Question, would he let his family eat it? No, this seed is not to be eaten. It's to be invested in the ground, to take a risk, cared for in the summer, harvested and multiplied in the fall. Now, the same is true of some of your money. If you set aside, and I suggest, part of your capital should be set aside for an enterprise to show a profit. And we can teach kids the early fundamentals of capitalism. If a child buys a bottle of soap for $2 and sells it for three, maybe he goes next door and says, Ms. Brown, I've got this soap mama uses, it's really terrific. I need to make a little extra money. If you bought the soap, I could make a little extra money. It's only $3. And I'm here just next door, I take care of you when you run out. Pretty simple. Ms. Brown says, well, to be honest with you, I've got plenty of soap. Kid says, you better let me come in and check. <laughs> Kids don't need sales courses, no. They don't need 13 closes. Now, Mrs. Brown said, okay, you got me. Here's my $3. I'll buy a bottle of soap. Now we must teach the child what to do with this $3. So jot this down. Here's what we say. You must now set aside the $2 that you first invested to buy another bottle of soap. He said, well, that's true. You can't spend the whole $3. You'd be out of business. Kids can understand this stuff. Some adults, you see, don't know that. So you can't spend the whole $3. You've got to set aside $2 so you can buy another bottle of soap so you can sell it for three and make a profit of a dollar. Now, once the kid's now, kid has a dollar profit, now what should he do with the dollar? This is the formula that I've come up with. What to do with that dollar? Don't spend more than 70 cents. 10 cents for church or charity. 10 cents to invest back into your business so that someday you can buy more than one bottle and get it a little cheaper so that when you sell it, you make a little more money. I mean, kids, you don't have to be General Motors to understand the mechanics of capitalism. Now, guess what we call this little kid that's now engaged in this enterprise and is making a profit? We call him a capitalist. And the communism, com, communists used to say those no good capitalists. This little kid selling a bottle of soap? He's a capitalist. They didn't understand. And with their diabolical philosophy, capital belongs to the state, they wrecked every nation they touched. This is the key. So 10 cents to show a profit. Now here's the other 10 cents. It's 10 cents that you invest and let someone else use it. This is called active capital where you actually engage in the enterprise that makes a profit. Now, another 10 cents is for passive capital, where you let someone use this 10 cents out of every dollar. You put it in a bank that pays interest. They use it, and they pay you for the use of this money. That's called passive capital. So we've got active capital and passive capital. 
Maybe you invest this in a stock, eventually, if you have enough money. And the stock pays you dividends. And also, there may be an increase in the value of the stock. So this is the little formula I come up with. 70, 10, 10, and 10. It's very simple. And kids can figure it out. Kids can understand it. Enterprises that kids can be involved in starting early. Charlie said, right? Got his kids involved in enterprise, making a profit, showing a profit. Okay? Now, when you first start, if you're an adult now, you may be in such bad shape financially that you couldn't do the 70, 10, 10, and 10. If you're in real bad shape, you may have to do the 97, 1, 1, and 1. Because it may take this to pay your bills if you haven't had a good plan up until now. But jot this down now. It's not the amount that counts. It's the plan that counts. So let's say you were in such poor financial shape. You had to start 97, 1 for charity, 1%, another 1% for active capital, another 1% for passive. Now here's the key to get these numbers starting up and get this number starting down. If you will actually do this, you can't believe how exciting, how exciting it is to watch the numbers change. Remember what Schoff said. If you will change what? Everything will change for you. If you start to change, I'm telling you, these numbers will start to change. And the first thing you know, these numbers keep going up, 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 until finally you can get to the 70, 10, 10, and 10. Now, when you make a lot of money, these numbers all have to change again. You know, if you're making fortunes, you can't spend 70%. That would be obscene. I probably spend less than 10% of my income. So this number, this is where I had to start, 97, 1, 1, and 1, finally getting to 70, 10, 10, and 10. But now, as time has passed for me, and my fortunes have increased, this 70 has gone way down to 10. And now you can imagine, if the 70 has gone clear down to 10, you can imagine now what these numbers will be. These numbers now, whew, off the scale. Here's what it is, a good plan to consider. So make this note, it's your life and it's your future and it's your economics. This is just a suggested plan. You can tear this one up and develop one of your own. I'm just here to stir the pot. I'm here to stir your mind, to get you to think. Now, here's two or three more keys on financial independence. Here's number one, keep strict accounts. Part of it is just for habit, and the other part is for self-esteem, and the other part is for future benefit. Keep strict accounts. It's just a good habit to have. It's like picking up the trash. Not throwing the toothpick cellophane on the floor. It's just, it becomes the person you are. Keep good accounts. Here's the next one. Pay your taxes. I finally became a happy taxpayer. Here's what paying taxes does. Feeds the goose that lays the golden eggs called American opportunity. You say, well, the goose eats too much. Probably true. But make the note, better a fat goose than no goose. Here's the next key. Everybody should pay. My personal philosophy is everybody should pay federal taxes as well as state or whatever else. It's not wise for the government to let one-third of American citizens off the federal tax rolls. Why? Because that robs them. Appreciate that. It looks like I could run for office here. Here's what it does. If you let them off the federal tax rolls, it robs them of the dignity. They have to pay state taxes. They have to pay uh, sales tax. I've been trying to write this book for so long called, Of Course Kids Should Pay Taxes. When a kid in California walks into 7-Eleven and buys something, costs a dollar, the proprietor asks the kid for eight more pennies. Kid says, what's these eight pennies? He says, that's the taxes. The kid says, I'm only eight years old. And the proprietor says, congratulations, you're my youngest taxpayer. Give me the money. <laughs> Should kids pay taxes? 
Yes, if you want to ride your bicycle on the sidewalk instead of in the mud, you got to cough up the eight pennies. <laughs> what if you're poor? Do you pay the eight pennies? Yes, what if you're rich? Yes, meaning everybody should pay. The same should apply to federal. I don't care if it's $10 a year. I don't care if it's only $100 a year. As poor as you might be, you've got to say, no matter how poor I am at the moment, I will make my contribution. That's the key. So everybody should pay. How much do you think aircraft carriers cost? We pay our taxes so a policeman will walk the beat so we can sleep like a baby. Hey, the Air Force doesn't sleep. The Army doesn't sleep 24 hours. So you can sleep as much time as required. Peace of mind. The missiles are ready and the aircraft carriers are there. Saddam Hussein sticks up his head again. It gets blown off. <laughs> We've now got him in a no-fly zone. No-fly zone on top, no-fly zone on the bottom, right? We couldn't go after him, couldn't kill him because that wasn't the policy. But we've now got him in a very small corner where tyranny needs to be. Because when it is let loose, it could do like communism and Nazism, cover one-third of the world before we get it stopped. So, you got that down now? I got to pay for my aircraft carrier. I got to pay some young volunteer that risks his life on night landings on an aircraft carrier. You got to pay if you want that kind of security in the world. Of course, we may disagree sometimes with government policy and all the rest, but I'm telling you, everybody needs to pay. Now, here's one of the best stories ever written. According to the record, Jesus and his disciples one day were at the synagogue. And on this occasion, they had an interesting project. And that was to stand outside the synagogue as people started coming in, putting money in the treasury of the synagogue. And as Jesus and his disciples stood outside watching the people come by, putting their money in the treasury, it said, some came with large amounts, put them in the treasury. It said some came by with modest amounts, some came by with small amounts. Then along comes a little lady, and she puts two pennies in the treasury. And Jesus said to his disciples, look at that. They said, two pennies? What's two pennies? He says, no, you don't understand. She gave more than everybody else. They said, two pennies is more than everybody else? He said, yes because I'm positive her two pennies represented most of what she had. So since she gave most of what she had, she gave the most. Now here's what did not occur in the story. I'm so brilliant, I can give you what the author left out. <laughs> here's what did not occur. When the little lady put her two pennies in the treasury and walked away, here's what didn't occur. Jesus didn't run after this little lady and said, hold it, hold it, little lady. My disciples and I have decided that you're so pitiful and you're so poor. We have decided to take the two pennies out of the treasury and give them back to you. I'm telling you, that did not occur. If it would have occurred, she would have been what? Insulted. Hey, it was only two pennies, but it was most of what I had. Would you rob me of the joy of giving my two pennies? So that scene did not occur. So jot this down. Jesus left her two pennies in the treasury, even though she was poor. What does that mean? Everybody needs to pay, even if it's only two pennies. Wow. Great story.